Jennifer Brackett, who is the um, is the special events coordinator for the Caring for the Caregiver program. And I'm Carol White. I'm faculty at the School of Nursing and lead the Caring for the Caregiver program. And here you can just see a little bit about our program. We've been going, um, I guess, for three years since we started offering services for families. And now we're doing more services research and each is informing the others. Our mission is to support the health and quality of life of family caregivers and their loved ones, integrating a strength-based philosophy of care into our program. And that's been important for us because often people living with dementia are told what they can't do. And so we really want to build on their strengths. And similarly with um, family caregivers and then doing this um, presentation today focused on staff who work with within um, institutions, memory centers, nursing homes, really building on what you know and um, and to go from there in terms of your support for families. And we envision a community where family caregivers are valued, respected, and particularly supported with compassion and where we can help them to find joy in their caregiving experience and then committed to values of equity, social justice, collaboration, and then um, really going um, from a person-centered approach in what we do to a family-centered approach in care. Um, just a couple of little um, things here, if I can get my mouse to go. Um, this is a bit small. It's a part of three series where we really wanted to be working with um, memory centers, long-term care institutions to talk about dementia-capable care. And we talked um, a couple of weeks ago about dementia friendly and how that can be incorporated into the work you do. And then today talking about advanced care planning, which is really important um, is to the whole um, dementia capable care. And then in early um, December, and Jennifer will talk about that a bit at the end, we'll talk about, um, we'll talk about um, dealing with behavioral challenges. And Laura Novak, who will be speaking, has um, extensive experience. She's an occupational therapist, faculty again at UT, has worked in nursing homes and has worked for more than 20 years with families living with dementia. In this tiny little box where you can't see it, um, just wanted to um, mention that this program that we've been giving has been in, supported by a visiting scholar in aging research endowment um, given to the School of Nursing. And we are asked to use it this year, which we did to really support um, dementia capable care. So thank you to them for that support. Um, this program is eligible for um, CEs, two hours of CEs for um, nurses and for social workers. And you can see the link um, to go and get that after completion of the program. And you can get that for $25, which is a nominal cost just for processing the CE. And then there's, um, you can fill out the form there. Um, and then just in terms of um, conflict of interest, Jennifer and I have been on the planning committee with Center for Lifelong Learning at the School of Nursing. We have no relevant um, conflicts to, to um, declare. And similarly, Kim Overbau, Kristen Overbau, who's giving the talk today, Dr. Overbau also has no um, conflict of interest to disclose. And then just the, the continuing education statement, which we need to read, is that they're accredited to provide a CE for this activity, which includes completion of the entire activity, which will be recorded. And so for um, the rest of your staff, if you have social workers, nurses who would like this CE, um, it will be archived in the Center for Lifelong Learning and be available for others to complete. So completion of the entire activity and then the final assessment quiz, um, you'll be, you're, this is available for up to, or for um, two contact hours. So um, to get to the heart of today, um, it really is my tremendous pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Kristen Overbau. Um, who's an assistant professor at LaSalle University. Um, she and I worked together um, for a few years at the School of Nursing and she was part of our original group who, um, who really um, in initiated or implemented the Caring for the Caregiver program. 
and Kristen always had a very special role in there knowing how important advanced care planning is for families living with dementia and how important, and I'm sure that um, Kristen will be discussing it today, but how important to have these discussions early when um, people living with dementia are able autonomously to talk about their desires, their wishes. Um, and I'm sure we'll want to hear from you today in terms of um, your experience in nursing homes, the challenges you face when these things haven't been put in place before their loved one is admitted to the nursing home. So Kristen has over 25 years of nursing experience working um, as an educator in practice in management and she really has focused on um, chronic illness including heart failure and dementia but I think her expertise has been in palliative care and um, and really supporting um, advanced care planning for people living with dementia among other chronic conditions so with um, with that in mind please join me in welcoming Kristen, I'm so happy to have you here today. Thank you. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Are you ready, Jennifer, now for me to share my screen? Okay. Yes, we're ready to go. Thank you so much. Okay. Just give me one second to do that. <laughs> Oops. Mm. Looks good. Thank you. Yeah, let me just get back to the beginning. We were, we were practicing earlier just to make sure that the screens worked. Mm. I still can't get over how pretty these slides are. They really are. So sorry here, you're seeing the whole presentation before we even get started with it. <laughs> so as I'm scrolling through this, I just want to um, thank Dr. Carol White and other members of the Caring for the Caregiver team um, I just saw Debbie White, I mean, Debbie, uh, Debbie James pop in. So, so hi, Debbie. It's so good to see you too. Um, I really want to thank uh, the Caring for the Caregiver team for inviting me to participate in this series on dementia capable care. I also want to thank all of you in the audience. I'm not sure exactly what role you play, uh, what your interest is in being here today. Um, but for those of you that are working in long-term care settings, I just really want to thank you for the care that I know that you're providing, you know, for people living with dementia and other chronic illnesses. Uh, and then if there's any family caregivers who are able to join us this afternoon, I just want to express my gratitude for all of the very hard work that I know that you do each and every day. So I do, rec I recognize some sort of faces and some names, so I'm not sure if I've met some of you in the past, but um, again, I'm happy that you're with us today. I think that the last several months have, have challenged all of us in many ways. Um, certainly those of you working in long-term care and uh, families who have loved ones in long-term care setting, I think that the uh, pandemic has certainly made it more difficult for people to be together. Um, and in some cases, it's made it more difficult for individuals to make decisions regarding health care. So I think that um, advanced care planning is a really timely topic. And again, it's one that I'm very passionate about. Uh, feel free to, you know, uh, write questions in the chat as we're going through the presentation. Uh, certainly, I think we'll have time at the end of the presentation uh, to address questions, and I know that there's a lot of expertise in this area, in this area, in this room. Um, so I'm also very interested in hearing about your experiences. So I, I think we're going to begin by defining advanced care planning. And I know that this may be review for some of you in the room, but our understanding of advanced care planning has really changed over the last several years. So I think that this is a important place for us to begin. We'll spend a little bit of time talking about the current state of advanced care planning in the United States, specifically in long-term care settings, and then in the context of dementia. And then we'll finish up by discussing some strategies that we can implement to more effectively um, promote advanced care planning for people living with dementia. So as I mentioned, uh, our understanding of what constitutes effective advanced care planning has really evolved over the last several years. 
So the focus is not only on the completion of legal documents, but also the importance of having advanced care planning conversation. So advanced care planning today is really described as this process that enables individuals to discuss their preferences, their values, and their goals of care for future medical treatment and end of life care. And so ideally, um, or ultimately, the goal of advanced care planning is to really ensure that an individual's wishes are honored at the end of their life, should they lose the ability to either make these decisions or to communicate these wishes. Um, so at the center of effective advanced care planning really should be these meaningful conversations that individuals are having with their family members, their closest friends, and of course their medical providers uh, about what is most important to them as they consider these decisions. So ideally, uh, advanced care planning should begin when individuals are healthy, not really at the time of medical crisis. Uh, unfortunately, many of us know that that does not often happen. Um, and many times individuals and families are faced with making these really complex decisions at the time of a terminal diagnosis or in conjunction with some type of life-threatening illness or injury. So uh, it's important to understand that these decisions can change and oftentimes do change over time as an individual's health changes. So this conversation shouldn't be something that happens just once, uh, but we should be um, you know, revisiting these conversations uh, with our loved ones on a fairly regular basis. So in addition to these advanced care planning conversations, it is absolutely still really important that individuals document their preferences in state approved advanced directives. And again, I know that some of this uh, may be review for some of you in the audience. Uh, but in the state of Texas, uh, advanced directives consist of the medical power of attorney and then the directive to physician and family or surrogate. So a medical power of attorney is a person that an individual assigns to make healthcare decisions for them uh, if they would lose the ability to make those decisions for themselves. And then the directive to physician and family or surrogate is essentially Texas's version of a living will. So this is where an individual documents if they would want life-sustaining treatment or alternatively treatment that focuses on comfort. Now this directive is, is only valid if a person is diagnosed with a terminal or an irreversible condition. And any advanced directive is only applicable, it's only relevant if a person can no longer make decisions or no longer communicate decisions at any time point. Okay. So there's a variety of life-sustaining interventions that are addressed in advanced directive forms, and this will vary based on state law. Traditionally or typically, all advanced directive forms address CPR, cardiopulmonary resuscitation, and mechanical ventilation. And so that's a um, treatment that we provide for an individual who is unable to breathe on their own. And you may, you may hear that referred to as um, artificial respiration wishes. Now, now some states like Pennsylvania, where I'm living now, they list very specific uh, interventions on their advanced directive forms. So in the state of Pennsylvania, um, uh, individuals can um, indicate their preference for things like dialysis, chemotherapy, radiation, and then uh, medically um, provided uh, nutrition and hydration through a tube. And sometimes you'll hear that referred to as artificial nutrition and hydration. So these are the types of interventions that individuals should be including when they're having these advanced care planning discussions. I also want to take a minute and just talk briefly about an out-of-hospital DNR order. Uh, if an individual 
um, documents within their advanced directive that they would not want to be resuscitated should their heart stop. Um, it's still really important that an individual obtains what's called an out-of-hospital DNR order. Without this order, uh, the healthcare team must initiate CPR regardless of what is written in an advance directive. So this out-of-hospital DNR uh, should be part of advanced care planning conversations. Um, you know, when a, when a patient is admitted to the hospital, uh, the nurse will ask if they have an advanced directive. And if the advanced directive says that they do not want to be resuscitated, the nurse needs to communicate that to the provider. And then the provider will uh, sit down and verify that with the patient and the family um, and, and write an inpatient uh, DNR order for that person. If that person then is transferred home or back to a long-term care setting, um, it's important for them to have this out of hospital DNR order. Now, the other order set that uh, you may be seeing in Texas is called a MOST form. And this is a medical order for scope of treatment. Uh, and some providers, some facilities are, are using uh, this order set. Uh, and that's another order set that can document uh, that a patient would not want to be resuscitated. So I just wanted to mention those two forms because they're not, they're separate than what's in the advance directive, uh, but they're important to include in the discussion. So advanced care planning really helps to ensure that family members and healthcare providers are respecting an individual's right to autonomy. So autonomy is an ethical principle uh, that essentially means that we're allowing an individual uh, to make their own decisions about their own health care. And sometimes you'll hear that referred to as self-determination. So, so far we've talked about uh, rather advanced medical interventions. Um, but in addition to that, it's really important that when we're having these conversations, with our family members, with our loved ones, that we're really taking the time to try to understand who that person is. Uh, what have they valued most throughout their life? Uh, what continues to be important to them today? Uh, what are the things that bring them joy, make them happy? Um, for those of you who um, uh, are supporting people living with dementia, uh, you know that these questions are really, really important. Um, we know that dementia can take away not only an individual's memory, uh, but their sense of self. So it's so important that we do everything we can to really try to preserve that individual's personhood. And by asking these types of questions, uh, we are better able uh, to honor a person's uh, values and their preferences um, as we provide care for them. So let's talk just a little bit about the state of advanced care planning uh, in the United States. Um, back in 1991, uh, we implemented the Patient Self-Determination Act of 1990. Uh, and this, this is a federal law that requires all healthcare organizations to notify individuals on admission of their rights uh, in writing to advance healthcare directives. So although this law was implemented almost 30 years ago, we still have a significant number of Americans who have not completed an advanced directive. Uh, back in 2017, there was a really large systematic review that was published and it found that only 36% of adults in the United States had executed an advanced directive. Uh, and this was a large study. It examined the prevalence of advanced directives in almost 800,000 adults living in the United States. Now, the good news is that we're actually doing better in long-term care setting. Uh, almost 78% of individuals who are living in residential care communities have an advanced directive on file. And that number has improved uh, since 2004 
Um, there was a large uh, national nursing home survey that was published at that time that some of you may be familiar with. And at that time, um, we found that 65% of individuals living in a nursing home had at least one type of advanced directive on file. Now this study also um, broke these data down by region within the United States and um, states sort of um, in the mountain region, so states like Colorado, Utah, New Mexico, uh, they had the highest percentage of nursing home residents with advanced directives at almost 88%. And at that time, uh, Texas, uh, which is part of the Southwest Central uh, region um, had the lowest percentage. Um, certainly that number could have changed over the last several years. Uh, and really what these numbers tell us is, is just that they have this documentation on file. They don't necessarily tell us if residents and family members have really engaged in meaningful conversations with their healthcare providers and they also don't tell us if the care that the individual received was congruent with that person's wishes. So there's been a little bit of research uh, th that has looked at advanced care planning uh, for individuals living in long-term care settings. Uh, and what we know is that older adults living in these settings and their family members report little involvement with having advanced care planning conversations. Uh, they report being involved in uh, conversations about practical decisions, so things like finances and making funeral arrangements. Um, the older adults involved in these studies really expressed um, gratitude for the opportunity to be involved in these types of conversations and their family members also shared very uh, positive feelings about, um, about being uh, included in these types of conversations. So both the residents and family members uh, prefer what we call a shared decision-making model. And so many of you may be familiar with shared decision-making. This is essentially when the resident and the family member partners with the healthcare provider and other members of the interprofessional team to make decisions. And so the healthcare provider's role is making sure that they're providing comprehensive, accurate information uh, to the resident and the family member so that they can make an informed decision. We wanna really ensure that they understand their dementia diagnosis, that they understand the normal trajectory of dementia and that they also understand the uh, potential um, uh, treatment options, um, risks and benefits of those options. Okay, so as many of you know, uh, almost 50% of nursing home residents have either a formal diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease or other dementia. And, um, a, you know, a, a dementia certainly can uh, contribute to uh, significant disability, uh, dependency, and, and oftentimes these individuals are living with other comorbid illnesses. So heart disease, depression, diabetes, um, and, and those illnesses can also uh, negatively impact function or quality of life, and in some cases increase symptom burden. So this is the population that uh, we're talking about uh, providing advanced care planning for today. And again, I know, I know that many of you are really familiar with this information, um, but because dementia is a uh, progressive, a neurodegenerative uh, condition that impacts cognition, uh, impacts memory, person's ability to make decisions, a person's ability to problem solve. As Carol mentioned in her introduction, it's so important that we begin these advanced care planning conversations as early as possible. Uh, and sometimes that's a challenge because we know that individuals can struggle to receive a formal diagnosis of dementia. So you can see from these numbers that uh, dementia continues to really be a, 
a growing health crisis uh, across the globe uh, and certainly within the United States. Um, the most common cause of dementia, of course, is Alzheimer's disease, which accounts for 60 to 80% 80, 80 of cases, and that's followed by uh, vascular dementia. Okay, so um, in addition to, you know, dementia being a progressive neurodegenerative condition, it, it, it's irreversible. Uh, we have to help people to understand that it is a terminal illness uh, that eventually results in a person's death from either the disease itself or from complications associated with dementia, uh, such as pneumonia. And I know that, again, many of you are familiar with the stages of dementia, uh, which are typically classified as um, early, middle, and late, uh, with corresponding um, um, symptom categories. And individuals can progress um, through these stages at, at varying rates, but they typically spend the, the longest period of time in, in the middle phase, the middle stage. Um, when, we, when we start to identify uh, signs of early dementia, these mild symptoms, if, if a person hasn't engaged in advanced care planning, uh, we really need to um, you know, make sure that we begin uh, some of these conversations. Okay, so what we know about advanced care planning uh, in dementia is that less than 40% of people living with dementia worldwide are given an opportunity to participate in advanced care planning conversations. However, those who are given the opportunity have some beneficial outcomes. Um, we, we see decreased hospitalizations, we see increased documentation of advanced care planning, but most importantly, we see an increased congruence between that individual's wishes and the actual care that they are receiving. Some studies have actually looked at advanced care planning for people living with dementia, specifically in nursing home settings. Uh, and some of, these, some of these studies included uh, the resident um, in the advanced care planning um, conversation and in order for the, the resident to be involved, uh, a provider had to um, you know, determine that they had the capacity to participate. And so that essentially means that the resident has the ability to understand the nature of their decisions and the consequences of those decisions. But again, in these studies, we saw very similar out, uh, outcomes. And again, most of these were, were beneficial outcomes with, again, the most important being that there was congruency between the individual's wishes and the care that the resident was receiving. So the majority of these uh, programs combined education with the implementation of decision aids or tools that served as prompts or triggers to uh, initiate ongoing uh, advanced care planning. Um, these interventions also found that when the provider uh, who knew the resident the best was involved in the process, um, care was improved and that there's a need uh, to engage all staff um, in advanced care planning initiatives. By doing that, um, we're better able to improve the resident's participation. And we'll talk more about specifically, you know, how we can do this uh, on some upcoming slides. So this idea of determining capacity is probably one of the biggest challenges uh, in dementia populations. And I, again, I think the good news is, is that this is really a, a, a growing area of research. So there's a lot of people working really hard to try to figure out what is the best way for, for us to include people uh, with, with dementia um, in these conversations. Uh, what we do know is that people with dementia can participate in shared decision-making. 
Uh, most of the studies have been done with individuals with, with early dementia. Uh, some studies have include pe people with moderate dementia. What they found is that using um, um, general cognitive assessments such as the mini mental state exam um, or, or a provider's assessment at just one time point are probably not really sufficient um, to make this uh, determination. Uh, they also found that these informal discussions that we're going to talk more about uh, can really provide very valuable information uh, to the healthcare team to ensure that we're really honoring a person's uh, values and their preferences for care. Okay, so let's talk about some uh, strategies that, that staff, that leaders can implement to more effectively promote advanced care planning. Uh, and the first and the most important, of course, is education, um, educating oneself and then educating the team that you're working with. And this is essentially what we're doing here today. Um, so it's important that you're educated on uh, state laws that guide advanced healthcare directives uh, in your area, and that you're also really familiar with policies and procedures at your facility. So I'm really interested at the end of the session from hearing uh, from some of you on current policies and procedures um, that, you, that you have in place uh, to promote advanced care planning. Now, I think um, many of us learn best through experience. Um, so step two is encouraging all of you um, to discuss your wishes with the people that are most important to you uh, and to complete your own advanced directive. Uh, and I know that many of you in the room today probably have done that, um, but if not, um, doing so is gonna help you to become uh, more comfortable with the process more competent, more confident, and that's going to help you better assist residents and family members who are going through this process. Uh, so many of you may be familiar with some of the landmark cases that informed the Patient Self-Determination Act. So uh, names like Karen Quinlan and Nancy Cruzan, these were young women um, in the prime of their life, they were in their 20s, they were in their 30s, and they were impacted by uh, devastating injuries and illnesses uh, that left them unable um, to make decisions and unable to communicate decisions about their health care. So it's really never too soon again to begin these types of conversations. And we really like to frame it as if you're, um, you know, giving a gift to your loved ones. You're helping to reduce potential uncertainty that they might experience, potential feelings of guilt um, that they could experience um, should they have to make these decisions for you uh, without really asking you what your preferences uh, would have been. Okay, so there are multiple resources out there to assist people in uh, beginning these conversations. And the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, in partnership with the Conversation Project, uh, developed what they call a starter kit. And this is specifically for families and loved ones of people with Alzheimer's disease and other forms of dementia. Um, and it, it helps um, individuals and families begin and continue these conversations. So I'm hoping to be able to share with you this really short video uh, of Ellen Goodman. She is the uh, co-founder of the Conversation Project and she'll introduce you to this resource and she'll talk a little bit about how her own personal experience helped to contribute to the development of this starter kit. issue of Alzheimer's and dementia is close to my heart because it was close to my family. My mother suffered from dementia at the end of her life and my sister had Alzheimer's. My experience caring for my mom at the end of her life was difficult. My mother and I had talked about everything 
um, except really one thing, which is how she wanted to live at the end of her life. I remember getting a call at the office and I was on deadline and the doctor said she had pneumonia again. And did I want to uh, treat her with antibiotics? And I thought, excuse me, you know, could I call you back? Could I wait a minute? What are you asking? Do I want her to live or die? And these questions that I was totally unprepared for, in fact, blindsided, came rushing at me at various times. I always wished that I could have heard my mother's voice in my ear telling me what mattered to her, what was important, and the care she wanted and the care she didn't want at that end of her life. I didn't know how important it was to start these conversations early. I think I had that feeling that I could postpone it or I was so anxious about it or so worried that my loved one, my family member, would be horrified or freaked out. And, and I think now that when you don't have those conversations early, you're not really helping the person you love. You're leaving them alone and you're leaving yourself alone. And the more that you can, in a, in a caring and gentle way, start being open about these things, really the better off it is for both of you. What we're trying to do is help everyday people um, have these conversations with the people they love. And if those people are in too much of a cognitive decline to have them, we want to tell them how to bring those voices into the room so they feel comfortable that they are speaking for the person that they love, even if that person can't literally speak for himself or herself. The conversation starter kit gives people that companion. It's a companion to go through this process and it gives you a step-by-step -step sense of the questions that you can ask and the way to go about it when it gets tough. And it's a, a comfortable companion through a really difficult situation. Okay. So she's much more elegant than I could be um, in describing um, the starter kit um, for people living with dementia. So this is the starter kit might be a resource that you or your organization might be interested in reviewing, uh, maybe something that you've already reviewed, but I thought it might be helpful for us to walk through uh, some of the components together. Um, and again, it acknowledges that there are certainly some um, special circumstances surrounding advanced care planning and dementia. And again, the mo probably the most important is that we want to begin this process as early as possible. Um, it's also important for um, us to understand that, again, there's delays in receiving a formal diagnosis of dementia, and that even once an individual receives a diagnosis of dementia, uh, either that individual or their family member, uh, you know, may be in a little bit of denial. They might be experiencing anger, they might be experiencing depression that's gonna make it difficult for them to accept that diagnosis, uh, and then certainly difficult for them to think about having these types of conversations. Um, it's important when working with people with dementia for family members and healthcare providers to look for uh, um, opportunities when the individual opens up by acknowledging some type of a new limitation or maybe change in their condition. That might be a good moment to try to begin having this conversation if it hasn't started already. Uh, we also want to look for moments when um, the person living with dementia is more focused or more alert. Um, we know that people who live with dementia can become overwhelmed very easily, and so we have to anticipate that we're going to have to, um, you know, give this information and ask these questions more than one time. The information is going to need to be reiterated, uh, reinforced uh, in future encounters. And then also, um, since, since we're working to support family caregivers, 
uh, we need to realize that, you know, that anticipatory grieving process oftentimes begins when a loved one is diagnosed with dementia. And so then asking them to in engage in these advanced care planning conversations can be really difficult for them. So we just want to make sure that we're doing the best that we can um, to provide them with emotional and psychosocial support, acknowledging uh, this is important, but yes, we know that this is really difficult for you. Okay. So if we were in a large classroom together, I probably would break everybody into small groups. Um, and I thought about putting you in breakout rooms, but I just wasn't sure if that's something that everybody would be comfortable with. Um, and I didn't want anyone to feel sort of awkward having to talk with somebody about these you know, sort of sensitive topics. Um, so I thought what we could do is just um, go through a couple of the questions from the starter kit um, together. Um, and I'll just give you a few minutes to sort of think about them. And then maybe at the end of the presentation, if there's anybody that's interested in, in sharing their thoughts on these questions, uh, we can invite you um, to do that. Um, but the first question, um, just make sure I can see my screen here, is, uh, um, is just asking, as a patient, I would like to know uh, only the basics about my condition and my treatment or all the details about my condition and my treatment. And again, keep in mind that these are broad, open-ended questions, really just to begin this type of a conversation. And I just pulled a, a couple sample questions. Uh, the second question is, as I receive care, I would like my healthcare team to do what they think is best, or five, to have a say in every healthcare decision. If I were in the terminal phase of Alzheimer's or dementia, I would prefer not knowing how quickly it is progressing or knowing my doctor's best estimation for how long I have to live. And I think it's important to point out that there is absolutely no right or wrong uh, answer to any of these questions. Uh, certainly as healthcare providers, we're taught to provide patient and family-centered care, which means that we need to incorporate a person's personal values, their family values, cultural values, religious values, spiritual values into their care. And so, um, you know, by, by knowing how a person would respond to these questions um, helps to ensure that we are honoring those values. And then the last question, how much medical treatment do you want to try? I want to try every available treatment available, no matter how uncomfortable I become, or I prefer being comfortable, even if that means opting out of some treatments. And again, as healthcare providers, it's never our role to judge a person's preferences. So, so asking those questions will help us to determine, you know, sort of where a person stands on some of these advanced medical interventions, which will be decisions that people living with dementia and their family members uh, should address. Answering these types of questions will, will help individuals uh, begin to identify patterns or trends um, related to the type of care that they would like to receive. In addition to that, though, as I mentioned earlier, it's important that we use um, this as an opportunity uh, to not only get input about specific medical interventions, but to, to, to really try to understand who, who the resident is, who our family member is. And a good question uh, for us to ask is, what do you feel are the three most important things that you want friends, family, and or the healthcare team to understand about your wishes and your preferences for end of life care? So the timing and the delivery of that type of question certainly needs to be uh, appropriate. But we could also ask that question just in terms of their general day-to-day -day care. And if you have a resident who says to you, you know, I wanna make sure that uh, I'm listening to jazz music in my final hours. That is certainly something that we can accommodate. Um, 
so so this um, this type of information is going to uh, really help us to honor uh, the resident. Okay, so let's move on to step uh, three. Um, so we've educated ourselves, we've engaged in these conversations. Um, when a resident, again, is admitted to a long-term care facility, uh, legally we're responsible uh, to ask if they have an advanced health care directive. And, and I've not worked in a nursing home setting, I've mostly worked in acute care settings, so I'd be interested to hear more about this process. Uh, but I will tell you that uh, today, even in acute care settings, Oftentimes what happens is uh, the patient's admitted, we say, do you have an advanced directive? They say no. We say, do you want information about it? Um, they say yes, and we hand them a booklet of written information. Um, they may tell us they have an advanced healthcare directive, and then we say, can you bring us a copy? They bring us a copy, and we file it either in their hard chart or we put a copy of it in their electronic health record but we don't really use this as an opportunity um, to provide them the type of education that they really deserve on advanced healthcare directives. A resident may have completed their advanced healthcare directive 30 years ago and never really reconsidered these decisions in the context of a new diagnosis. They may not have had a recent conversation with whoever they've assigned to be their medical power of attorney. So this step three is really more than just checking off a bunch of boxes. Uh, it's using this as an opportunity, again, to make sure that they haven't changed their mind on any of their decisions and that they've been um, educated, again, on the trajectory of dementia in the context of any comorbid illnesses um, and available treatment options. And so who's involved in step three? It's certainly going to vary based on institutional factors, but it's typically going to include the nursing staff, a social worker, and the primary provider, if that's a physician or some type of an advanced practice provider, such as a nurse practitioner. And then step four, we absolutely need to make sure that um, uh, these, these decisions are documented uh, in the appropriate um, state-approved advanced healthcare directive and that those copies are appropriately shared with other members of the healthcare team. And then step five is ensuring that within our facilities, you know, mechanisms and structures are in place to give us opportunities to, um, you know, reassess advanced care planning decisions. This shouldn't be something that just happens um, when a patient is admitted, or it shouldn't be something that happens you know, when a, when a patient is, is um, taking a, um, you know, significantly decompensating. Um, this should be something that's discussed routinely at care conferences. Um, oftentimes what happens is patients start to have frequent uh, hospitalizations for things like falls or pneumonia or UTIs. Uh, and that's when this conversation um, happens again. And then step six is making sure that we're involving all of the staff in helping uh, residents to meet their goals. So we know that our nursing aides and assistants, they're, they're really spending a majority of time uh, with residents. Um, so I'd be curious to find out if, there, if there's any nursing assistants in the audience, if you know what your residents' goals of care are uh, related to end of life care decisions. Uh, you should have access to this information um, you know, just like you have access to what their diet is, what their activity level is. Uh, by knowing this, it's going to help you to uh, promote the type of care that, uh, that they want. So I thought we'd try to tie all of this up by uh, talking about, um, you know, one of the decisions that's probably most difficult uh, for people living with dementia and their family members and again, that's certainly issues surrounding uh, nutrition and hydration. So we know that with advanced dementia, we know in the terminal phases of dementia uh, that an individual with, with dementia will lose the desire to eat and drink. Um, but we, we wanna make sure that, um, you know, we're making an appropriate uh, assessment and that we're implementing best practices and standards of care uh, you know, prior to the time where that 
decision really needs to be discussed. So typically what happens is somebody with dementia uh, will start to lose a significant amount of weight or they'll stop eating. Um, and, uh, you know, we need to think about what are all of the other factors that could be contributing to that weight loss. Uh, so weight loss in dementia, is, it is complicated, right? It could be a combination of uh, behavioral and cognitive factors. Uh, resident could be having issues with chewing or swallowing or could be problems uh, with dentition. So all of those things need to be assessed before we make the determination that the client is in the terminal phases of dementia. Uh, and before we get to that phase, again, we need to make sure we're implementing best practices. Um, so are we accommodating a resident's individual preferences um, uh, for eating schedules and, and food choices? Are we making sure that we're offering, you know, those foods that we consider comfort foods for people living with dementia, those soft, sweet foods? Um, are we making sure that we're providing them an environment to eat where we're minimizing excessive stimulation, uh, where we're appropriately addressing pain, fatigue, constipation? My grandmother, she's 96 and she is living in a nursing facility and she does have vascular dementia. She's otherwise actually fairly healthy, uh, but about a month ago, um, she stopped eating and it's been hard because we haven't been able to see her obviously on a real regular basis. Um, but it turns out that she had a urinary tract infection and once that urinary tract infection was treated, she got her appetite back again. So, so again, we just want to make sure that we're doing everything we can to support a person with dementia's nutrition and hydration before they actually get to that terminal phase uh, where, they, where they do indeed, um, you know, stop wanting to eat and drink. Now, at this point, we've ho we hope that they've had a conversation with their family members, with their healthcare agent, um, that all of the members of the healthcare team know what their feelings are on this topic. Um, and, and it's just important that if that hasn't happened, that we provide them, you know, comprehensive and accurate um, education on the best science uh, related to tube feeding and intravenous hydration for people with uh, advanced dementia. And we, we know that there's really no benefits um, and in fact, that it can um, contribute to complications and sort of can increase symptom burden for people living with um, advanced dementia. Having said that, it's still a really difficult decision for family members. So again, part of our role in supporting that resident is, is helping to support um, the family caregivers. Um, and if we can um, incorporate advanced care planning like we've discussed really throughout this presentation, by encouraging uh, these conversations that help to promote uh, patient autonomy, help to promote informed decision-making, uh, we're gonna make some of these decisions much easier uh, for family members. So that is the end of this presentation. And I hope that that is what you were looking for. I hope that was helpful for you in the audience, but I, I am interested in hearing from some of you in the audience, if anybody has questions or wants to share uh, any experiences or insights on this topic. Thank you uh, so so very much. We do have a question um, that came in a little bit earlier. It said, if we get a phone order, but it is not signed by an MD, would residents still be considered a full code? So if you um, get a, a telephone a order over the phone, uh, like a DNR order over the phone, is that what the question is? I think so. Um, Anita, did you want to clarify? I believe so, because that's what you were talking about at the time it came through, I believe. Sorry, yes, could you hear me? Yes, thank you. Yes, my question was actually that if we get an order over the phone, a telephone order, um, would that still be considering them a full code until we get the advanced directive signed out of hospital DNR, correct? Yeah, so, and to be honest with you, Anita, I probably will need to follow up on that um, to find out what the policy is at your facility. Um, most of the time uh, before a provider uh, can initiate a DNR order, 
They need to document that they've had a conversation um, with either the patient, if the patient can participate, or their family member. Because mm -hmm. usually when they come in, um, sometimes there's, it's happened before where they come in from the hospital and they are a full cold. And then they stay long term and down the line, they want to change to DNR. So the doctor's not in, but we do get an order for the DNR but it's not actually signed. The telephone order was not actually signed. Now we're paper, we're paper disc, we're, we're going all computerized now. Um, I would think they would, I mean, would they still be considered a full code until we get that out of hospital DNR signed by the MD? Yeah, so I, again, I probably will need to clarify that. Anita, what facility are you working at? In uh, Morningside Manor. Morningside Manor, okay. And have you gotten any guidance at all from your uh, leadership or your administrators there? Well, we we, we have, and um, I have this conversation. I know they're, for me, they're still considered a full code until we get that out of hospital DNR signed. Some of the nurses I have to re-educate and reiterate, reiterate that importance that it has to be signed yeah. in order for them to be a DNR. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. And I just wanted to be sure that first you didn't have some type of policy or something like that. No, 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 yeah. no. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I feel like that is the right answer to that question. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it is a more difficult question, I think, in a residence because it's not like the acute care where you have physicians every day. Sometimes yes. yeah. they're coming mm -hmm. not as often. So yeah, that's a really important question, Anita. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Kristen, I also, Kristen, I was going to just add that sometimes taking the person from, let's just say the hospital mm -hmm. or the wherever they are, let's say the hospital to the nursing home to have the out of hospital DNR in place is required because yes. otherwise it's not covering anything. So the bottom line is I would make sure that everybody looking at their own facility, like you said, policy and procedure is the deal. Yeah. But yeah, looking at the transport situation, sometimes that can really hang you up. Yeah, absolutely. That's, you know, those transitions of care are oftentimes, um, you know, where, where gaps arrive in care, so. Mm -hmm. Kristen, I saw one of your earlier slides that was actually just a recent publication. It looks like you had about advanced care planning um, in the time of COVID-19. And I just wondered if you could speak to that. And I don't know if also people that are working in institutions, uh, how that's changed, how you've been thinking about, um, about advanced care planning. Yeah, so actually that was uh, something that I just published in um, Med Surge Nursing. Um, and yeah, so again, really just the thinking is, I think that the pandemic has just sort of highlighted the need for individuals to have these types of conversations. You know, we know that COVID-19 is, is, is impacting, you know, older adults, um, you know, with, with coexisting illnesses, but at the same time, there's still, you know, younger individuals um, who, you, who are healthy, you know, who are developing COVID-19 um, that are developing serious complications and in some cases dying from COVID-19. And because uh, families are not able to be with their loved ones in the hospital, have the same access to the interprofessional healthcare team, that decision-making process is becoming more difficult. So a lot of the um, organizations that promote um, earlier and ongoing advanced care planning, such as the Conversation Project, such as um, um, uh, the 